meeting to order. Um, the open meeting law requires that I notify the public that this meeting is being recorded. Therefore, please be aware that an audio and visual recording of this meeting is being made and broadcast by Boston City TV, which is part of the City of Boston Office of Cable Communications. So welcome to this meeting of the Boston, Boston Disability Commission Advisory Board. Uh, let's start with introductions. I'm Allegra Stout. I'm the vice chair, but I'm uh, chairing this meeting because Heather Watkins, our chair, wasn't able to be here. Kenyatta Campbell, board member. Mark Mallet, treasurer. Carl Richardson, advisory member. Daria Miller-Saney, board member. Kristen McCosh, disability commissioner. Thanks. Um, and let's go on to approve the minutes. Do we have a quorum? Yes. Yes, we do. Okay, great. So let's approve the, the minutes for the meeting in July because we didn't have one in August. I make a motion that we approve. I second it. Great. Uh, th let's take a vote on that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, the minutes are approved. Um, and now we have a presentation from the South Bay Architectural Pro uh, Project, and we'll go ahead and do that. See one of those? Thank you. Um, and uh, Mr. Richardson, we brought our a model of the project as well um, to help you better understand the site plan. Um, you might be able to, to feel the buildings and understand their arrangements better. So maybe Kathy, you could help us set that up. Would you prefer that? Is that okay? You could put it on the table. Could you hand them out anyway, just so we can have them? Thank you. I just found another piece. Yeah. So good evening. My name is Ryan Lori. I am uh, an architect and a development manager for the real estate company Edens. Forgive me if I appear a bit nervous. This is my worldwide television debut, first time ever on TV. Um, I'm here tonight with uh, our architect, Kathy Bell, with Stan Tech and um, Rob Rickey, our uh, uh, planning and entitlement consultant from Four Point Associates. Thank you for having us in. This is a, a great opportunity for us to not only introduce you to our project at South Bay, but to hopefully get some feedback from you all um, on the accessibility components of our project um, that we'd like to incorporate. Um, so first tonight, I'll tell you a little bit about my company, Edens, and um, touch on the sort of big idea master plan of the project, and then um, show you some Im images and describe them um, of, of accessibility components on other similar projects that we've done that we intend to implement here. Since we're really sort of in the, the design development phase, we don't have big details worked out for the project specifically, so I'll, I'll explain some examples. So firstly, Edens is a retail developer. We build, own, and operate properties up and down the East Coast. Um, traditionally, we, we own sort of um, suburban style grocery store anchored shopping centers, nothing too <coughs> exciting. But within the last five to 10 years, we've made a push into more urban, um, pedestrian scaled mixed use type projects like this one at South Bay. As a retail developer, um, we, we have an inherent sensitivity to the public space, the storefronts, the streetscape, the sidewalks. We found that the success of our retail is very heavily tied to the quality, success, and of course, accessibility of that public space. Um, so we put great importance on that and we want for everyone to be able to utilize and enjoy the great spaces that we try to create. So Edens owns a portion of the existing South Bay Center, shown here, which is in the northern end of Dorchester. Um, it's located sandwiched between I-93 to the east, um, Mass Ave to the west, Boston Street is a couple blocks south, the Andrews Square T is a few blocks further east, and um, the new market train station, which eventually will become a T, I believe, as well, is sort of on the northern edge. We've acquired about 10 acres immediately south of this area um, for this project. And that, that area is currently occupied by a couple vacant commercial and retail buildings, um, an, op an operating concrete plant, one vacant house, and uh, a whole lot of asphalt. And uh, our master plan for the project includes five buildings, shown here, and Mr. Richardson models in front of you. Um, uh, 
Uh, five buildings are a maximum of 65 feet in height for our PDA zoning height limit. Um, they are um, creatively, creatively labeled here A, B, C, D, and E, whereas A Are these all new construction and not rehab of any buildings? Um, buildings A through D are sort of organized along a, a broad main street that runs north-south through the project. The northern edge connects to the existing South Bay Center, um, whereas building E um, is sort of off to the east a bit, immediately adjacent to two existing hotels. That main street that runs north-south um, the space and make it a, um, a more interesting, um, a more intimately scaled space in the project that's only for pedestrians. Shown here is the ground floor plan. Just note the retail all along the main street. And then the, a, a typical upper floor which shows the residential units picking up the movie theater on the second floor of building B and the parking garage. And I'll transition um, into uh, some of the accessibility components from other projects that we'd like to implement here, of course, with the input from you, the BRA, BCDC, BTD, and various other organizations as well. And I'll start from the ground, um, the paving. While as an architect, I can certainly appreciate uh, the wonderful texture that brick and uh, cobblestones bring to Boston streets and sidewalks. Um, Edens loves the simplicity, the ease of use, the ease of maintenance of cast-in-place concrete. That's what we implement on all of our centers, what's shown here. Just simple, smooth concrete sidewalks with a light broom texture for good traction. What's also shown here, and in the next slide, you'll, you'll notice there is no curb. The, um, the sidewalk and the street are flush in the same plane so that we don't have to navigate, step up onto, step down off of a curb, and this, this curbless detail runs along the entire length of the main street. That sort of enables that, that space to act as one, and be more pedestrian friendly. Um, the, uh, the edge of the sidewalk is lined with a, a tactile warning strip. The whole entire length? That's correct, the whole length, not just at, at um, the corners. Edens loves the idea of jaywalking. They like for you to be able to go from one side of the street to the other to experience something interesting that you might notice over there. Um, and then again, there, there would be a, a two foot wide tactile warning strip to signify the transition from the sidewalk to the street. And for the city of Boston, that has to be yellow. I don't know if you're aware of that, that's shown in gray. Yeah, this is another project. I wasn't aware that it would have to be yellow. It's good to know. So there's no crossing streets, right? Like this main street, there's nothing to go across. Um, so there's only one street that can come in for a vehicle, right? And what volume of traffic do you expect? Um, we, we've made some efforts to reduce the traffic on that main street. Um, and let me jump to. Traffic is going to have jaywalkers. 
Sure, sure. That's a, that's a great comment. Um, I'll jump to this, this large question at the end. Um, this allows folks to enter the South Bay Center to enter this park the same way and take an immediate right turn into the park garage without having to navigate down Main Street. And that should take a significant amount of traffic off of Main Street as well as Sacramento. How many parking spaces in the garage? I'm sorry? How many parking spaces in the garage? The whole project is 1,066. Is there on street parking on the main street? Yes, on street parking. So we've, we've um, taken some measures to um, reduce the clear speed on the street. You'll notice the main street has a slight kink to it as it runs down to the, the main line here. Um, the purpose of that is to sort of slow down traffic. Um, you can use a small bend in the road to, to slow down or narrow up the travel lanes. Is all the parking free? No meter parking, no charge for the garage? I, I was going to ask, who's the way to? These, you know, these are other buildings that are around. Oh, the existing? Yeah. I think one of these two are under construction now, but it's, it's a reflection of. of is is the in greenery? Greenery. As far as, um, I, I understand you're building everything, but I, 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 is there like an area where the residents? Sit down and, and breathe some fresh air. I mean, I mean, it's showing where the area would be. Yeah, absolutely. I can point the finger on this. We have in this building here, this is that great. This is for, for public use. Um, this is a plant green space here, which some of the retail on the ground floor will, will back up to. So we have some outdoor seating here. And this is the investment right here. You can see the, the number of the letter C building. Okay, and, and then would there be seats or just an open green space? Do you have a detail of the crosswalk at the, on the main street? Like a, a, a slide, or no, just a slide that would show it more in detail than that? Uh, of the, cro the intersection, the crosswalks? Maybe if I go back to, is this helpful? Uh, I was looking for a sketch, like the plan. Oh, I, I don't know. Okay, uh, how wide will the crosswalks be, do you know? Um, they're probably they're shown here at 15 feet, but we haven't specified that yet. Okay. Um, I'll get, I can continue on to uh, some dimensional information about regarding circulation. Um, I, put it, I put this slide in here uh, titled Unob Unobstructed Circulation. I feel like this is um, sort of a simple topic that a lot of retail developments tend to miss, um, so that direct broad circulation space that's unimpeded by furnishings, um, by signage, plantings. Uh, we found that to be very important on a project that we worked on in Washington, D.C., immediately adjacent to Gallaudet University, which has um, a significant um, deaf and hard of hearing population. And we found that these folks, um, when they stroll on the storefronts, converse with signs, they, they need to have more space between them. Um, so it certainly helps in that regard, as well as um, a little more space is helpful for everyone to be able to move at their own pace as well. More comfortable environment that's more direct. Um, and so the simple street section here, the minimum in some cases is, is about eight feet where it gets tight. We certainly love um, outdoor dining and cafes, but we, we work to keep that sort of along the facade and then have our clear space and then followed by a buffer to the street with some landscape and plantings um, to help define the street edge and buffer it. Um, and that, that clear space goes on up to 12 feet and beyond in some areas of the project. Are there, are the entrances all universal? Like are there any places where there are stairs and a ramp or are they all level entrances for the buildings? It's a good question. I will. When, when there's one of a lot of barriers that people have that have no real issues. They're all level. They have that one step at the door as you come to a door you want to go in, there's that one step. I'm just curious to know, is, this, is, is, is it gonna be, uh, if you, 
are you going to have that a little more acceptable for people with wheelchairs? Yes, absolutely. We'll definitely avoid that one step. And this diagram I included here indicates that the majority of, of the public space is um, at 2% or less. It's a relatively flat site. There are a couple areas on the edges that are indicated in the yellow where the project site meets the surrounding grades where it has to, to pitch a little bit steeper, around about 4%, but it still doesn't require ramps or steps. We were nervous that the northern end might require some ramping, um, but we're working through it to ensure that it's just a, a, a more gentle slope that wouldn't require ramps or any steps. So you're saying the cross slope is at 4%? Cross slopes are always 2% maximum. This is just in parallel with the street. So the reason this project caught my attention was because um, they missed the accessibility checklist, which was just an oversight. So the, um, the team went back and filled that out, which is part of the BRA requirement. But more than that, we've had some experiences in the past with retail developments that have been um, much less aware of access in building and maintenance um, and have been very poor neighbors to people with disabilities. Um, we've had a lot of issues with Copley. I know it's an older site, but um, with Simon in particular. And I'm wondering, um, I know they have a lot of brick and they have different entrances, ramps versus stairs, and wayfinding is a nightmare for people with disabilities. So I'm wondering about signage um, towards elevators uh, and entrance, what the door entrances will be like. Are they gonna be the round turnstile doors or are they sliding doors? Because like I said, in some of the Simon properties, it's just been, um, really difficult just to try to get into the properties. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if it's a common entrance all level, which is great to know, but also what the doors are like and what signage is like to the elevators. Because when you have a bunch of people there bustling and shopping, it's really difficult if the elevator is not apparent to try to find it if it's down a hall or you know, not right inside the entrance. Could you just talk about that? Sure, little? sure. So the doorways, um, all, the, um, all the retail shops on, the, on this project face the sidewalk, so there's not internal circulation space. Um, I've never seen on, on our projects a revolving door um, or a sliding door. Um, that's um, something we could likely avoid. Um, Will they have automatic doors, do you know? Um, we have two spaces for larger tenants, um, sort of the junior box size, like a, for example, a Dick's Sporting Goods kind of thing. Um, that could, I could potentially see having an automatic door, um, but that's not set in stone. Um, and uh, to speak to the, the elevators, I'll, I'll scroll back to the floor plan. The uh, elevator for the parking garage is located immediately off the street. Right. Is it adjacent to the accessible parking? I think what Christian's asking about is that you'll just have appropriate wayfinding signage. Sure. In general, yep. Yeah, yeah, um, that's a very common thing. Is there anything on the wayfinding signage? Um, that's one of the biggest things for mitigation of accessibility issues. Like I said, people with sensory disabilities, they can't, if it's not apparent, it's really difficult to, to navigate in crowds. So if you could be aware of that. My hope would be where this is such a large development that it could even be a model project for accessibility where you were so willing to come and present to the board and open to our ideas. So maybe we could work with you moving forward to try to come up with, um, the point of the checklist is so that teams don't just meet minimum compliance, but they think about accessibility all the way through. So starting at the beginning and then working with us to implement new strategies like the point you brought up for people who are deaf, that's a great point um, to give more room for um, people who sign. So things like that, um, I'm glad to know they're on your radar. And um, this is a unique opportunity because it's all you, new construction. So you can, once you're working with new construction and it's all hasn't been de fully designed, well, I'm, we have a chance to, to make an impact, a, a positive impact for everybody. Because when you improve it for people with disabilities, you off, often improve it for others too without even realizing it. Um, on the residential, how many units? 475. And how many are going to be made accessible? 5% uh, uh, are accessible, are pipe B, pipe 2A. Okay. And the remainder are pipe 1. Are they
they going to be all different price ranges, or is it what, I mean? Um, Ten to fifteen percent of the affordable units. So there's sixty-one affordable units, which is I think thirteen percent of total. So Ten to fifteen percent of those are going to be developed as well. Because um, yeah, so. my question is, sometimes they they do the low income or the affordable housing like they're supposed to, and then sometimes they do the five percent accessible housing, but sometimes they're in the higher income range, so it would be nice if the accessible housing were also the affordable housing. Yeah, some units should definitely be accessible and affordable. And can I ask, who who's going to have the oversight of managing the complex, like the retail stores, as far as maintenance and usage and things like that? As you're going forth, you're, you're starting this out. What uh, are you doing for people with disabilities? As, as far as work, you guys, like you have, could you have a program for people with disabilities to come in and, and hopefully get some kind of jobs? Not on the, on the jobs, but as you're starting out and you're doing this, and you 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 think you'd be able to make a plan for somebody with a disability? Are you hiring people with disabilities to make sure that that's actually the working plan? So I mean, you're gonna go. You can go. You can have a hundred people that don't have a disability, make something for somebody with a disability, and just one little twist, an inch off, could be a major hurdle for somebody. So I'm just curious to know: Are you? Uh, do you have in your plans to hire people with disability? Is it gonna be a financial institution within the neighborhood? And in the neighborhood, there are people that have learning disabilities, some physical disabilities. Um, uh, the jobs going to be created for these people or, or at least some of the jobs be slotted where even if it's just giving a man a broom to sweep the floor can give him a lot of dignity. So I'm just wondering, have you looked at that area at all? I think that's something we can work on together moving forward. And that's a great point, Moses. I was going to mention that. Um, because I don't know if you know the area really well, but Moses, you may know, is this near the... Um, Public Health Commission shelter. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear. Is this property? It's near the homeless shelter. Is um, that correct? Yes, it's that's, um, yes, it's not very far from there. Okay. You're, go you're gonna have a large population of people. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No. You're gonna have a large population of of people that are, who are um, homeless, have mental illness, visiting visiting your place. As as you go forth, I would caution you to train your staff to deal with this population that you're gonna have to deal with. If you never, if, if they don't know how to deal with somebody that has this having an episode, then, then, then this could cause a problem for you. But if you taught them in the beginning, hey, we're gonna have people around here that may have some sort of issues. Mm -hmm. Let's put a, a little forefront, a little forethought into this and train our staff to deal with people who have disabilities. I mean, you got a security guy, but you train them how to take down a, 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 an aggressive individual. Have you trained them how to address an individual who's going into an episode or what triggers people off? And these little things will help if you know if you know if you can avoid a, a, a situation by using oh excuse me or, or understanding when to back off. I think that'd be a lot safer for your staff and the people that are going there. And since you're going to be around that that population, I think you should look into um, some sort of mental health training for the people that work there. And that, again, that's something we can help with. We can be a resource moving forward. You could come through us. Just contact me. Yep. And we can uh, link you with the right people if we're not the right ones. But I'm really glad that you all came just so that we could point out these issues that it's definitely brick and mortar, but it's much more than that too. It's being a good neighbor to the community, which are residents who live there with disabilities, visitors with disabilities, and the homeless shelter. It's the, um, I believe it's the city's biggest homeless shelter and it's only a few blocks away. So I think Moses is right. There will be a population of homeless <coughs> people in the area and training is key to, um, to deal with them just to be a good neighbor. And, and you also the project, that, uh, the, the project in South Boston, right across on the other side there. So you want to, yeah, you should, I think, yeah, you really want to pay attention to that so it doesn't become a problem. Uh, you be, best way to be, you know, is prepare for it. 
If you don't plan for something, you always fail. If you plan to know that this is that segment is coming, it will be. A, I think it will be a feather in your cap. Is there a shuttle stop off in that area? I'm sorry. Is there a shuttle schedule to come? I'm about to get to that. Great. Yeah, I think this has been a rich discussion, but let's leave the rest of the questions till the end so we can see what other yeah, information yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Um Sorry, you guys were so quick in the, in the beginning, I, I started to drag it out. Um, a few more things I'll speak to, our parking garage. Um, we like to be open and airy and bright. We illuminate our parking garages um, uh, to eight, eight to 10 foot candles, which is twice the standard of most um, parking garages and parking lots that you'll experience. We paint the underside of the the ceiling bright white so you get a nice ambient lighting as opposed to the glare conditions that you often get in other parking decks makes makes for a much more comfortable um, safe atmosphere in our garages um, and the last topic i'll speak to is connectivity um, while accessibility within south bay is important it's also important to us that we provide th those accessible links um, to the surrounding neighborhood and to greater boston as a whole so we've been working with the BRA to um, uh, take on uh, the work of, of renovating the sidewalk infrastructure that's to the south and west of the project. Um, it's it lacking maintenance, it's narrow, it's inaccessible or non-existent in some, in some areas. So um, the one location to the west of the project and the one is um, a new sidewalk. Where's the South Bay Shopping Center that exists now on that map? So there'd be sidewalk connectivity to, to that? And finally, our lovely bus. So right now we operate um, an accessible bus that links uh, Andrew Square Station to the existing South Bay Center. Um, we plan to somehow alter the route or introduce a stop or stops um, to integrate uh, the new project with that bus route to give connectivity to the city. And my uh, last slide is, is just some facts uh, that I added, we sort of spoke through the first few. I promised some some items on the residential, which we mentioned as well, the, the affordable and accessible units listed here. Mill Creek will be our uh, residential development partner. Um, they are an MHRP member. They employ an independent third-party consultant to do drawing reviews during design um, that comes out to the site to observe uh, construction progress and check for issues. Um, and also um, provides fair housing training for their, their development and construction staff. Um, their goal is to ensure fair housing, not just through design and construction, but where it often falls out in the management of the property. Um, they, they work to ensure that as well. So that's what I have prepared for you this evening. Any other questions? When, do, when, if you like, when would you start, you start construction again? And when um, would it end? We are hopeful to start next. And when would it end? Um, it's, it's complicated how the project is phased. Uh, we will start with um, buildings A, B, the two parking garage, the movie theater, the retail, um, and the residential development will start on, on the B building over here. That will be for this building, the residential C, will come, that will start six months to a year later. This right now is a concrete plant that's still operating. Is, is the residential owned ownership or rental? Rental. 
Why are you looking at only 5% accessible units? I understand that, that meets the requirements, but why not aim even higher? Great. Great. Any other questions? Animals. Animals? Mm -hmm. Dog, dogs, cats, are they allowed in the in the they will. They will? I'm sorry, did you say the shuttle was accessible? Yes. All of the shuttles or is it just one? It's just Is that free, the shuttle? Well, great, thank you so much, and we definitely look forward to you working with the Disability Commission Office as the project move for moves forward. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. How was your first TV debut? I'm ready to come back closer, Mr. DeMille. All right, we'll move on to the chair's report, and I have some notes from Heather things that she wanted us to discuss. Um, she had two main points. Uh, one is that she wanted to draw everyone's attention to the um, article that came out on in the Boston Globe on August 10th, um, written by Carol Steinberg, um, who's a lawyer who has a disability, who does a, a lot of work on access, and is president of the Disability Law Center. Um, and Heather says that she found it a great article, um, and she particularly brings it to our attention because it mentioned two bills um, in the Massachusetts legislature right now that we could choose to write letters about. Um, and one is House Bill 1021, which would require medical facilities to purchase equipment, like exam tables, chairs, scales, x-ray machines, and so on, and follow procedures to meet patient's accessibility needs. Um, and this is very important because wheelchair users often do not have access to proper health care. Uh, so we could consider supporting that bill with a letter. And the other is Senate Bill 1323, which would improve employment opportunities and increase the supply of accessible housing. Uh, it would expand the jurisdiction of the Architectural Access Board, which currently has no say over workplaces unless they are open to the public, meaning that people with physical disabilities are cut off, with, cut off from potential jobs. Um, for example, a university that was spending $7 million on a renovation didn't have to put in, put in an elevator leading to the fourth floor, uh, even though that space included the diversity office, officer's office. Um, mm -hmm. So that bill would make it so that employee spaces, as well as the spaces open to the public, have so to be accessible. The employee space has to follow the ADA. It would bring CMR 521 up to the ADA standards. Yes. So I think that it would be great for us as the commission to, or advisory board to write letters in support of both of those bills. Um, does anyone have questions about them or want to discuss that? Yeah, I would like to see more of the bill. I mean, when you, mm -hmm. you said one thing, uh, you, you, you took out the cherry, but I want to see what the rest of the, is in that bill, so I, I mean, so I could really support it fully. Absolutely, so how about I send out the uh, text for each of those bills and then we could take a vote on writing a letter at next month's meeting? Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay, great. The, these bills have been, well, the second one, I don't remember the first one, but the second one was in uh, the session last year and uh, was voted out of committee, but for some reason didn't make it onto the floor. Right. Um, so it was close. So I think a little pressure would, would put the second bill in the right direction. I agree. It's my understanding that that bill has been introduced several times over the last yeah. years. So uh, hopefully this will be the time. But, but now we have, and I don't want to get into too much detail, but now we have different leadership who might see it differently. Yes. And, and probably more favorably. So, so I think we should push on it. Great. So I'll send out the text of those bills. And Jessica, has a question or point? Can I, do you want to wait to discuss this at the next meeting, or should we make a motion to 
ask the commission to draft letters on these two initiatives now? Um, let's see what Jessica was gonna say. Um, I was just gonna say, I have the, if you have specific questions, I have the language on Senate Bill 1323, and also I spoke to the Disability Law Center today, and they wanted me, to, they would like me to mention that um, they are still looking for um, co-sponsors, so if anybody um, knows anybody who would like to co-sponsor that bill, I know that they're looking for um, more senators to co-sponsor. Thanks, and that's the one about architectural access yep, and appointment. that's the AAB one. Yeah. Is that the one making AAB equivalent yes. to ADA? Yep, that's the AAB one. It's also the one that is changing the language from handicap to person with disability. Oh, that's, that's one of the, in, the, that's in that That's bill. in this one, yep. Okay. Thanks. Has everybody heard about that change? Because I saw an article on it uh, a few months ago. I guess this, I knew it was a bill, I didn't know which one, but I guess it's included in this bill. It would strike the word handicap from the state law and replace it with, um, is it people with disabilities? Or accessibility. It says, it says strike handicapped persons and inserting in place thereof the following words persons with a disability, um, physically handicapped person to person with a disability, physically handicapped person. So it has everywhere in, in that where it says physically handicapped person, change it to person with a disability. And that was one of the things we discussed in the parking subcommittee, changing the language on the parking signs from handicapped parking to accessible parking or disabled parking. So and that's a mm -hmm. double reason to support it. And in this case, it's not just a language change, but it also makes the laws broader because they all apply to people who have phys disabilities other than physical ones. Yep. Sure. Um, so given that Jessica has the language, uh, do folks wanna discuss that now or would anyone prefer to wait and take the time to think about it and discuss it next month? I have a thing about next month. I wanna okay. chew it up myself. Great. I so cut it up and see what they got hiding in there so I can ask you good questions. Absolutely. So Jessica, could we have both of those bills on the agenda for next month, please? Sure. Great, thanks. Absolutely. All right, and I'll also send out that article that uh, Heather was referencing. Cal and, Cal and, uh, Cal, excuse me, who, who wrote that um, piece that was, I think it was in the Globe, um, is also a member of the Architectural Access Board. Yes, thanks. Um, so the other issue that Heather um, b brought up in her report was about the change in the open meeting law relating to our ability to have um, remote participation by the phone or by internet um, in our meetings. Um, and so she uh, quoted um, an email that Jeff Dugan from the Mass Office on Disability um, sent out, uh, including some language from the Mass Office on Disabilities staff attorney about how we could implement that. Um, and so it's a process for enacting remote participation for the com for the commission. Um, so they write that below that note that the roll call vote um, can be done to allow remote participation for a particular meeting only, or in the alternative, the vote can be for all meetings going forward. You need only denote such fact during the vote and in the minutes. Um, and there are just three steps th that we would have to take to do that. The first step is to have a quorum of commissioners physically present, which we do right now. And step two, uh, have us take a recorded roll call vote of the following, uh, and the language is pursuant to MGL, Mass General Law, C30A, Section 20E. We now vote to authorize remote participation, and then either generally to all the commission's meetings or for the specific meeting. And step three would be to enter that into the minutes, and if the vote was yes, that would be in effect. Um, so, uh, does does anyone have any questions? Is it clear what that means? So you have to do that at the start of every <laughs> meeting. <laughs> um, no, so we would be able to either do it at the start of a meeting for to remote to allow remote participation for that particular meeting, or do it once, say right now or next meeting, and have it apply going forward. So it could be a blanket. Yes. Okay. Well, we have a quorum now. What do folks want to do? What is your vote, Jessica? Is that a motion, Carl? What is your vote, Jessica? We have a quorum. Yeah. So you could vote for it now. Oh, That's what I'm saying. We have a quorum right now. So yeah. do we want to do we want to move forward and say that we want to allow remote participation for future meetings, given that we have a? I think you still have to have a quorum present at the meeting itself, right? A physical quorum? 
That's a point that I'm a little confused about because I think what happened was that the intention of the legislators passing the law was that you would not have to have a physical quorum present, but because <coughs> of the way it was written, um, the Attorney General's now office said that you did. So I don't remember if that was clarified. If you, you don't mind me. Please. My understanding was that before a remote petition was not allowed, remote participation was not allowed, mm -hmm. and that they said, okay, we'll allow it, but you still have to have a physical quorum to allow it. Otherwise, they're afraid of nobody showing up and everybody talking over the phone. Yeah, I think that I have the same understanding, except that I believe that the intention of the bill of the bill was different. That the intention was actually to allow. That might be the case. Yeah. But I agree with you about the reality. So, so I let's go ahead and vote on that. Unless anyone has other questions, Carl, did you want to make a motion? Sure, I make a motion that we move that we accept uh, remote participation to take place in all future meetings moving forward. So I apologize. Actually, I think we might have to use this actual language, so maybe I should make the motion. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I move that pursuant to MGLC 30A Section 20E, we now vote to authorize remote participation generally to all of the Commission's meetings. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 But, oh, do we have to do a roll call? Oh, yes. Um, Zari? Yes. Carl? Moses? Yes. Kimiata? Yes. And yes. All right. Um, so now remote, remote participation will be activated for all commission meetings going forward. Good work, everyone. And that concludes the chair's report. Let's move on to the commissioner's report. Kristen? Thank you, Allegra. Uh, first, uh, my report is I have some news about the board membership. Um, ben Rue has let us know that he will be stepping down from his position on the board. So we have one opening currently. He resigned um, immediately um, when he sent us the letter. Um, he thanked us all for our hard work and he's very interested in staying involved. He just has a lot of other things on his plate right now. So um, we have an opening, like I said, and I, I do still have some resumes from the last um, opening because it wasn't that long ago. So I'm gonna review them and um, also post it probably for a month or so. So if anyone knows who's interested, anyone who's interested, please let them know. Yes, please. Absolutely. What did, you, what did you say? What did he say? He wants to send recommendations of people for the board. And that's fine. <laughs> so in my office, some news. I have a new hire starting in two weeks. She is Chanel Smitherman. She is a young woman who just graduated from Wentworth. Institute of Technology, so she has a degree in architecture. She's gonna be working under Catherine to help with AAB and BRA projects. She'll be a project coordinator, so hopefully she can be the liaison to the board to help you all get projects to you for written comment or um, just information <coughs> so that you'll know what's going on. I know that's been a, a lack of a link really between the board and the AAB because there are so many projects that happen and um, so we, we hope that she'll be able to connect with you moving forward. So she starts October 5th. Also, another administrative update is we are doing our web page over, and we'd like to get bios and photos of everybody. If um, people could talk to Chris after the meeting, just to let him, he has the list of who's given bios and pictures, and if not, we'd like to do that as soon as possible. The is city. Is a group picture or a single picture? No, a single picture. Just so we can put your picture up and write a little bit about you on our web page, so people know who the commission members are. Okay. Sometimes it's nice to put a face with a, a board. So we hope that people will attend our meetings. Once they see your face, Moses, they'll be sure to come. Run. Everybody will just run. <laughs> uh, other administrative news uh, City Hall now has two completely ADA compliant bathrooms. They're on the fifth floor, they are single stalls. They were fairly accessible before, but the sink was kind of in the way. So now they've moved the sink and um, lessened the door opening pressure before it was too heavy. So now um, they're completely accessible. They're also gender neutral bathrooms. I don't know if people saw that announcement over the summer. So um, that's a big win for City Hall. All right, updates on some recent activities. We um, participated in the D Disability Summit, the first annual Disability Summit at the Abilities Expo last week. 
I spoke about ADA Title II, government services, local government services, over the past 25 years. I gave an update on what the city was like before the ADA 25 years ago, what changes we've made in the last 25 years, and what the city looks like now. Some of the things I highlighted were the access path on City Hall Plaza, the captioning at our meetings and City Hall, City Council meetings, and um, the transition plan for curb cuts, making them in concrete with yellow tactile warnings. I can send you all the PowerPoint if you're interested in seeing um, the changes throughout the years in the city. We also participated in the Abilities Expo. We had a table. We had some volunteer help from Kim Yada. Thank you, Kim Yada. Moses, and I believe Zari. So it was a, a great, um, great event. Some initiatives we have currently uh, in the pipeline. The State Task Force on Handicap Parking Abuse is wrapping up its two-year report. That will be out in the next few weeks. So I met with the Inspector General's uh, staff last week just to update them on our work on the revising the city's handicap parking. So I'm gonna wait until their report comes out and then I'm gonna write up my recommendations and I'll send them to the subcommittee who met on the handicap parking changes last year and I can update the board at next month's meeting uh, prior to making the recommendations to Mayor Walsh. Does anyone have questions or input about that? Okay. Um, we also are working on the Disability Housing Task Force that Moses is on. We are waiting to schedule our next date, and we are going to take some action steps. Uh, from here on out, it pretty much it's just been um, ideas floating around, but now we want to take some steps to actually make recommendations to Mayor Walsh to improve housing for people with disabilities moving forward. Um, Go Boston 2030 is a transportation and policy and project initiative being undertaken by Boston uh, Transportation Department. They are still looking for suggestions on how to improve transportation in the city. They are having uh, pop-up outreach events in the next few weeks. We can send you those dates and locations if you would like to contribute any ideas to that. And other than that, I believe um, we have Catherine's update. Oh, I'm sorry, one of the update. Um, October is National Employment Awareness Month and I'm doing a lunch and learn training for City Hall staff next Friday in this room at 12 o'clock. If anyone would like to come, you're welcome to. I'm gonna uh, do a presentation on welcoming people with disabilities in the workplace. So it's an hour long presentation and you're welcome to come. Uh, Disability Mentoring Day this year will be October 6th. It's gonna be with JetBlue at Logan Airport. We're gonna bring a group of disabled um, people from the Boston area to have a day of training and mentoring and learning about job opportunities at JetBlue. We have our film series coming up in October. Do you have the date of that, Jessica? October 7th, I believe. Let me double check. And did you include a flyer in the handouts? I did not, but by the end of this meeting, you will all have one. <laughs> and I believe Cambridge is hosting this month's I'll meeting. <laughs> I yell at people for not using the mic, and now I'm not using the mic. Um, I just confirmed it. It is um, November 7th at oh, 2 November? p.m. Okay, I saw November, October. November 7th um, at 2 p.m. It is called La Casa Linda. What it's day a documentary. Of the week is that? It is a Saturday. It's a Saturday at two at Cambridge Public Library. It's a documentary called La Casa Linda. The uh, filmmaker will be also be there to um, hold a discussion afterwards. and I'll have flyers for you. Great, thank you. So that concludes my report, and I will just move into Catherine's architecture report since she was unable to attend tonight. Um, one thing Catherine's working on is creating an app for accessible route planning trips for pedestrians. Um, we've been working on this with Public Works and BTD for a while to try to create an app that people could use on a smartphone to put in a location beginning and end point and then it would map out a route, that route that's accessible with sidewalks, curb cuts, slopes, and um, accessible pedestrian signals. So that's under development now. She's working with a group of students from Brandeis, and we hope to have a pilot done in the next few months. We're also working with other cities across the country. We have a meeting, a phone conference call next week with Baltimore. Um, let's see what else. 
um, we have continued participation in the Vision Zero Task Force, which is a group that has the goal of making Boston have zero pedestrian deaths. Um, many other cities in the country are working on this initiative as well. And pedestrian deaths also include bicyclists. And if you follow the news, there have been several pretty gruesome bicycle deaths over the summer. So it's something that we put a lot of thought in when planning streets, sidewalks, and bike lanes. And bike lanes have become standard practice in the city. So it's really important that we are aware of safety and uh, really putting the pedestrians before vehicles when we plan our sidewalks and streets. Um, let's see. There's also an opportunity to weigh in on a new BRA development planning process. On the what? It's a new BRA, Boston Redevelopment Authority, planning process that they're doing in South Boston and JP and West Roxbury. There are workshops on October 1st and September 30th where you can participate to help vision a new development of main corridors in these streets. And Catherine has more information on the details. I don't know much about it, but I can have her send you details and email if <coughs> you'd like to, like to participate. And other than that, Catherine is also on the subcommittee of AAB, who's rewriting the regulations that we talked about to make the AAB equivalent with the ADA. And that would be a huge benefit for people with disabilities in the state because basically we wouldn't even have to go by the ADA. We could go by AAB because it would be the same regulations and that would give us a lot more local control. People wouldn't have to go through the feds when they have complaints. They could actually have them resolved at the state level through Tom Hopkins, who is a huge ally of people with disabilities. And um, we, we had a uh, thought of asking for a letter of support for this separately. Is that the same letter that we talked about? Okay, so that's the letter that we talked about earlier. Okay, and um, that is it for Catherine's report and my report. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? I have one. Um, so am I correct in understanding that we won't have ASL interpreters anymore since Ben is not on the board? At this point, no, unless we have someone who requests it, uh, a guest, a visitor, or if we appoint someone to the board who needs it. Okay, and who should someone contact to request that? If they, they contact me or Jessica. Jessica. Okay. Great, thanks. All right, uh, any other questions? Okay, then we will move on to old business. Do we have any old business? What about the letter that we sent out today? Um, I think that's we'll under old yeah. action items. So that's coming up next. Uh, anything else for old business? All right, then old action items. So the agenda says advisory board letters re-sandwich boards on sidewalks and Uber. Um, so we have the text of those uh, in our handouts. Um, Carl, did you want to discuss them or? Are we supposed, I, I guess I'm wondering, are, were you asking us to approve them or are those the letters that are going out? Great question. I think that we already voted on it, um, but Jessica, you look like you might have comment on that. Um, I believe we voted to write them and send them out. Uh, they have not gone to offices yet, so if there is a glaring thing you would like to change. I thought the letters were great. Great. Then I don't think, then they'll be delivered tomorrow. Great, thank you. <coughs> All right, are there any other old action items? Okay, moving swiftly along. Any new business? Hey. Yes, Moses. I was at the, um, the, the expo there, and a guy brought something to my attention, and I wanted to bring it to the board's attention. He said that when he comes down the wheel, uh, down onto the sidewalk, and they have the yellow paddy thing, he said that a lot of them are faced right out to the middle of the street, instead of going from one side to the other side. So if you come down there, and you move at any kind of speed, you are liable to be end up in the middle of the street. Also. He said that if somebody that was blind was walking and they would use that as, a, as a, a guide, it sends them right into the middle of the street. So I was just wondering, is there a way that we can look at that and see? Because I mean, as you well know, if you're going down this ice and slippery and you hit that, you hit that, that, that down patch, you can go right into the middle of the street and get hurt. Moses, are you this is Carl. So I use the tactile strips all the time for <coughs> visually impaired person. So I'm trying to get a better understanding of what you're saying. They're only about 
18 inches long, so that no. it's not really possible. For do you mean the Do you mean the location of them? The yellow one. Yeah. The yellow one. I uh, think are you are you talking about that they're on the corner instead of yeah. on the side? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. those are called apex curb yeah. cuts. Yep. Okay. And they're actually not allowed by the AAB unless uh, there are certain circumstances that require them. Like there are three instances when they are allowed. One is a vault or a it's uh, like a light pole that can't be moved. Yeah. Um, I forget the other two, but they're all technical reasons why they're allowed. And in any new development, that's something Catherine and I look at on all the plans. So there should be no new apex curb cuts being built, but there are plenty of them existing in the city. Your friend was right about that. I can't hear you. Hold on. Okay. I, I said there are plenty of them already existing in the city. Your friend was right about that. So um, when we do reconstruction of of intersections, we always move them to the side so they line up with the crosswalk. Because the APEC ones, like you said, they lead you out into the middle of the crosswalk, which is very dangerous. That's why they're illegal. Uh, well unless I, I, I told, yeah. I promised him that I would bring it up at this board meeting, okay? Yep. And, and let you all know what he was talking about. No, it's a good point. It's a very dangerous way to, to construct an intersection. Contractors used to do it to save money so they didn't have to create two curb cuts. Yep, exactly. Yeah, and, and I can see that too, but as, as what he was explaining to me, it, you know, my disability isn't that one, so I have to listen to what other people say, and I try to no, absolutely. explain that to the board. But they are now illegal, so the only one that person's coming across is old ones. Yeah. That were done for I can send you the AAB um, information on that, which tells you the three circumstances when they're allowed. Can you make note of that, Jessica? But believe me, Catherine and I are on that in all developments and reconstruction. It's not allowed. Yeah, thank you for bringing it up, Moses. Um, I have another question, also based on an experience with a friend. Uh, are there any regulations around menu accessibility, particularly for cafes and restaurants that post their menus um, above the counter and don't have a paper copy? That's a great question. I actually don't know. Would you know, Carl? No, there are not. <laughs> I mean, there should be, but I know that there are not. I see. Hmm. Hmm. All right, thank you in you know in our infinite time and energy and political capacity perhaps that's something we could work on at some point yeah <laughs> uh great any other new business no okay new business. well i guess i'll go ahead and ask then um for in in terms of the menu situation carl do you know if there's been any effort to change that to create any access regulations i'm not aware of any so okay. am is, is the person that you were with, I'm assuming, that, are you talking from a visually impaired perspective? I think she actually has a cognitive disability and maybe you just couldn't read at that distance thing, in small print. On, depend, or co yeah. Um, I don't know, but I can certainly look into it. I, I really don't know whether there are, whether that's been an issue. Um, because if, the reason why I know it, there are no rules, because if you think about it, um, not only this person's dealing with above, you know, mm -hmm. the counter issue. But every time I sit down, I don't get an accessible yes. menu, no matter what, unless that restaurant was um, considerate enough to also produce one of Braille or large print. Mm -hmm. So, no, they're not. But I think the way they get around it legally, and I'm not saying I necessarily agree with this, but they can say it's a reasonable accommodation for the person to work there to read you the menu. Yeah. Yes. I but see. I think that's how. I think that's how businesses and establishments get around it, because they can say they can always make their employers, I mean, the employees read the menu to them. Okay. Thank it you. might be something, though, that we could list as a best practice and do outreach to businesses, not that they have to do it, but to say, you know, if, you've if you haven't thought about it, that could actually work into our Main Streets program that Catherine and I are working on to make businesses kind of like model businesses for people with disabilities, the Access Main Street. And that's a great point. Um, we could put it in, in the training. That would be great. Restaurants. Yeah, I think to have Braille and large print as yep. well as just typed copies. Yep. Great, great thank idea. you. Or even audio. I wonder if they could set up some sort of audio, like with headphones. That, that would, seems like that would be pretty easy. Sure. But I'm just thinking off the top of my head. Great, thank, thank you. you. Um, any other new business? Okay, and do we have any new action items? Uh, all right. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, yes. Hey, can I make the motion to adjourn? Not yet. <laughs> 30 seconds, Carl, I promise. <laughs> I just want to clarify, um, we're not, we did not vote 
to write any letters of support for the bills, correct? Correct. So those votes will be will occur next meeting and I will send out the bills tomorrow. That would be great. Thank you. And did we move next month's meeting date? We moved, yes. We officially moved um, next meeting's date to October 29th to accommodate for um, a large event a where some people are being honored, like Allegra. Can, can I mention, <laughs> can I mention, oh, can I, can I mention that the vice chair of this uh, commission is one of the people being recognized and honored at the Disability <laughs> Policy Consortium event? Thank you. Yes. You go, girl. Yay. <laughs> well deserved. I hope well you can deserved. all come. Uh, where, when is it? It's the, on the evening of October 22nd, which is a Thursday. Where is it? Where is it? It's at 1199 SCIU, um, 150 Mount Vernon Street in Dorchester. Oh, yeah, I seen that. I seen that. Yeah. I was going to go on to that. Great. Give me a reason to get dressed up. Yeah. Tickets Just do like cost I can send it $60, out. Whoa. but... You know, we know John Winsky, so maybe if you just ask him, you can okay. work something out. But I can't promise that. <laughs> Kristen, what were you saying? Uh, Jessica can send out the information on the event. That makes sense. I have the event. I have oh, you it. do? Okay. Yeah. I'll send it out. Yeah, just send in case out. anyone wants to send it. Thanks. Am I allowed to make my motion? Uh, do we have any public input? No. Unlikely, since we have no public. public. All right. Yes, Carol. I make a motion that we adjourn. I may second that a motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great, we're adjourn adjourned. Nice. Shut them down, brother. Shut them down. Thank you. You did. You act like you did that all, all the time. You're a very efficient chair. I have another announcement now that we're off the TV, uh, which is that I'm, getting, I'm engaged. I'm getting married. Well, congratulations. Disability office for the University of Southern New Hampshire now. Okay. But he lives in Dorchester. He has a child. He's a parent. He understands disabilities. I don't know whether. He